color green. Now think of all the green things. Do they all take a little piece of the color green? Or does the color green come down and reside completely in each and every one of those things? Let's consider. Hello philosophers, I'm Chico. Welcome to The Philosopher Show, where we consider the greatest questions of human history. Recently in this playlist, we've been looking at Plato's doctrine of the forms, and we're in his dialogue, The Parmenide, talking about challenges that he's presenting to that very doctrine. Now in the dialogue, they use a different example than I'm going to use today. But for this objection, I find the following one a little easier to see. If you have kids, you know that they can be real smart aleck. I think I've said before that I have three, and they're little Weisenheimers. I don't even know what that word means. For example, you say, just a second, and what do they say? One. Now imagine you're trying to help your, let's say, 11-year-old son do an art project. And he says, I don't understand the directions. What should you do? You should say, figure it out. You can read. But instead, let's say you go over there and you see what the directions say and you say, well, what's to understand? It says here to paint the statue green. Now let's say he pulls a classic kid move. He feigns ignorance and says, what's green? Now rather than not engaging, as you should not, let's say you make the fool's mistake. You begrudgingly say, it's the color of that plant, as if he didn't know. He, of course, wants to push you further. He says, how can I take the color off that plant and put it on this statue? What do you say now? Pro tip, you don't need to answer that question. He totally understands what's going on. I suggest something like, gee, I don't know. Guess you're gonna fail your project and be grounded. See ya. But let's say you do the classic parent mistake. You try to explain philosophy of language to an 11 year old child when you don't really understand it yourself. You say, I don't mean that specific color. I'm." There's the color green, and then there are green things. He responds, so the color green isn't that thing on the plant? Well, where is the color green? What are you gonna say now, mom or dad, guardian? Now, if you're like me, here's what went on in your mind when you said that last thing. I say, there's the color green. And in my mind, I picture a green field, and I don't mean like, a field of grass. I mean like a, you know, big flat stretch of green. And my mind overlays it onto the universe. And then I say, there are green things, and I picture the plant, the statue, et cetera, et cetera, and they're kind of like on top of that green. And that shows me that they're related to the green. And then, I, and this is where I don't know you're actually gonna follow me here, but in my mind, I mentally shake the objects around a little bit so I know, okay, this one's getting green and this one's getting green, and that's how I know that the color green is related to these things and is making them green. Well, that's pretty much Socrates' picture of the forms. There is the form of green, which is the color green itself, and then there are these green things. The green things are in some way related to the color green, and that's why they're green. Now, in my head, I shook the object so I kind of like know that, yeah, the color green is making them green, but I don't have a real way to picture it. That's just sort of a, a placeholder move. Socrates uses the word partake. He says that they partake partake in the form of green, and that's why they're green. But is that much better than my nebulous shaking motion in my mind? What does it mean to partake of the green? Does it mean they take part of the green, or does it mean that they take the whole green? Well, when I stop shaking those objects, and I start to think about what this relation is, I see the objects in my mind resting on that field of green. And with that picture, it seems like the plant and the statue and cars and whatever, whatever, they all get a little piece of the green. That's what the the picture looks like. Unfortunately, I think that's a problem with the metaphor or image or whatever this is. I use that metaphor to help myself understand what's going on, but the metaphor only goes so far. Again, it's not like there's a physical field of green overlaying the universe. That's just the only way I have to picture it in my mind. And the picture could be misleading in the following way. I see how physical things have parts and how those different parts can be green, but the color green doesn't have parts. It's not like there's one part of green that's to the left of another part of green. I mean, the whole point was that the color green itself wasn't any physical thing out there. So the forms don't have parts. Now, if you're not convinced yet, this problem is compounded by some of the objections that Parmenides gives in the dialogue. I'll switch to one of his so that you can see what I mean. Let's say the plant and the statue are not only green, but they're also large. And let's say I'm using the same logic I used about the color green. I say there are large things and then there's just largeness itself. And that seems like the same explanation that Socrates gave. There's the form of largeness, and then there are large things that partake in that form. But on this picture that I just gave, all the large things are taking 
a piece of the form of largeness. But that means they're being made large by small things. Whereas we thought the form of largeness, because it is largeness itself, is making them large. Not only that, the more that they take away from the form of large, the smaller it gets. So largeness can't have parts. So it can't be the case that things that partake in the forms partake in just parts of the forms. But then we only have one other option. It must be they partake in the whole of the form. But let's say they're both taking the whole of the form green. Parmenides points out, now it's like the form of green is existing in two separate places at the same time. You have form of green here in the plant, form of green not here, then form of green here in the statue. You have one thing that's existing wholly in two separate places at the same exact time. And that seems absurd. If I told you the plant existed here and over here at the same time, you would think that's ridiculous. In the same way Parmenides says, it can't be that the whole of the form exists in two places at the same exact time. Parmenides literally says it would be that the form is existing apart from itself. But Socrates has a counterexample. A day can exist in two separate places at the same time. And this is supposed to be an example of a thing that does exist apart from itself. So I'm in San Clemente right now on a Friday. That same Friday also exists up in Newport. Seems like a good move, but Parmenides gives a counter. How can a day be in separate places at the same time? He says it must be like a sail that you laid over different parts. And that's just the taking part model that we saw earlier and rejected. Now I have heard a lot of philosophers that object to what Parmenides has to say here. They say all he's done is switch up the analogy. It still stands that the same exact day is wholly present in San Clemente and wholly present in Newport Beach. Now I'm not a great interpreter of Plato, so I'm not sure that this is exactly what he meant, but I prefer to look at this as an objection to the existence of a day in the first place. I think Socrates is looking at a day as in something on the calendar that you can see on your watch. And Parmenides is looking at a day as that field of sunlight that moves around the earth as the earth rotates. Now if we're looking at it as a field of light, then it is the case that in San Clemente I only get a part of that field of light and Newport gets a part of that field of light. But if we're looking at it in Socrates' way, well that thing is just weird. Is Friday a real thing that moves along the earth as the sun moves along the earth? And then all of a sudden it gets to the international date line and boom! Turns to Saturday. That's weird. No, instead what I think a day is, is a measure of the change of the earth in relation to the sun. So the real thing here is the sunlight and the earth moving and not Friday. That may sound super weird to you, but notice what I'm not saying is that Friday doesn't exist at all. I'm saying that Friday is based on something that exists, which is the earth rotating and the sunlight hitting us, but it's not a real thing in and of itself. So I kind of think Parmenides' objection does go through. However, note all that he's done is knock out Socrates Socrates' counterexample. He hasn't disproved the possibility of the same form existing in two places at the same time. And note that there's not a contradiction in that. You may say, hey, but that's super weird. Yeah, but this whole thing is super weird, right? I mean, the whole point is Socrates is positing these forms to explain a weird phenomenon. They don't exist like anything that we see physically. And he thinks we only believe in them because they explain other things. Now, if they're non-physical and they don't behave like physical things, why not say that they can exist wholly in two different places at the same time. One final idea is, if you think that these forms are just so bizarre now that they're existing in two separate places at the same time, you should check out quantum physics. At the smallest level of physical reality, we have particles that are doing all kinds of bizarre things, including action at a distance. One particle moves one way, and another particle all of a sudden moves another way. So it seems like the one affects the other, even though they're not touching at all. And we have nothing on the macro level that acts like that. So maybe at the level of the forms, we shouldn't expect them to behave just like the physical things in our macro world either. So here's another challenge that we have that's given in the Parmenides. Explain how the particulars partake in the forms. What is this partake relation? Let me know if you have any questions. We'll check out a little bit more in the next video on this Universal's playlist. That's all I got for today. Adios.